If you're looking for a car that's fun, functional, and offers comfort, all in one cool and fun package, the 2023 Kia Soul is your answer. The all-new Kia Soul. Visit kia.com or a local dealer near you. LAS Studios. Hi, this is Brian Los Santos here. For How to LA Today, we're going to bring you an episode from the new LA Studios podcast, K-Pop Dreaming. The series looks at connections between K-Pop and Los Angeles, all told from the experience of host and writer Vivian Yoon, who came of age in K-Town in the 90s and 2000s. And for this episode, Vivian and her childhood friends visit KCON, an annual K-Pop and Korean culture convention that takes place in Los Angeles. The extravaganza started right here in Southern California and has been bringing diehard fans from all over the world to the city to meet K-pop stars, hang out with other stands, and get their fill on all things K-pop. Enjoy the episode. It's a fun one. I never in my life thought I would ever actually go to K-Con. Oh, really? Me neither. I didn't even know that was a thing. This is me with my friends, Sarah and Randy. We all grew up in Koreatown in Los Angeles and consider the neighborhood home. And right now, we are on our way to the convention center in downtown L.A. to visit KCON, an annual convention centered around K-pop. The event started in Southern California 10 years ago, and it's become the biggest fan event for K-pop and Korean culture in the U.S., which is why I felt like we had to go. Oh, why would you go left there, Ajma? So we're all in Sarah's car, and as I look down at my outfit, which is this, like, white T-shirt with black flowy pants, I start feeling like I'm severely underdressed. And my friends feel it too. I should have dressed like HOT with their overalls. With their uh, ski outfits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I should have done that. Oh, man. I feel like I should have bleached my hair. I know. All the ideas are coming as we're going, but like not while we're preparing. We're all kind of nervous. None of us have been to KCON before, and we're not really sure what to expect because K-pop now feels so different from what it was like when we were kids. And even though we can sing along to all the hits from the first and second generation of K-pop, we're not as familiar with the groups that are coming out now. We pass by the arena that we used to call the Staples Center, which is now known as the Crypto.com Arena. Crypto.com. Crypto.com. I can't believe they kept the .com in there. I know. And then we engage in that classic downtown LA activity where you just kind of circle around looking for parking. Sarah is not a fan. Oh, downtown. I have not missed you. (laughs) Wrong way. (laughs) Okay, it's confusing though. (laughs) It all just looks the same. Whoa, 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 lady. Oh Oh, my. I feel like when you drive around downtown, you have to expect to at least go around in circles once. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, LA. Just love and hate it. LA. LA. Finally, we park inside a structure and we're ready. I'm like already oh, park it's, sick. It's good. Let's go. Let's step outside. Yeah. Let's let's do fresh it. air. Let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. I'm sweating. Me too. My tits. My gosh. We're not sure where to go from the parking lot, but we see some other people walking and follow them, hoping we're headed in the right direction. Let's go in through that bigger door. Ooh, okay. All right. We step through the doors of the convention hall, and the first thing we see is a giant booth for a Korean food brand. I know, the first thing I saw when I walked in was gochujang. Yeah, gochujang. Bibigo is sponsoring this. The whole floor is full of booths and vendors with colorful signs. There's even a McDonald's truck in here giving out free fries. The truck is plastered with colorful sticky notes that people have written messages on. Which is super Korean. Tons of restaurants and cafes in Seoul have the same kind of interactivity built in where you write notes and stick them on the wall while waiting for your food. I look at the KCON schedule on my phone, trying to figure out where to start. There are so many events listed, panels, workshops, speed friending. K-pop pop quiz, who knows K-pop best? Oh yeah, yeah that'd be fun. Yeah, between the three of us. Oh no, we would. <laughs> no, we would lose. As I look around, 
I can't help but feel out of place. People around us are dressed in K-pop-inspired outfits. Lots of platform boots and pastel skirts, mesh sleeves, stockings. Oh, she had really cute heart-shaped goggles. Oh, that's cute. A booth nearby starts playing music. Oh my god, that's crazy. We're running to follow this group of high schoolers who are heading to a huge crowd. And fans who are just chilling in the area start singing along. Some people even start dancing. They know all the choreography. Oh, they all know the dance. It's amazing. It's like a flash mob. That's so cute. Amazing. Wow. Which is something I noticed on the way in, too. Fans just busting out K-pop choreo, dancing together, even if they're strangers. And when someone is really good, the crowd hypes them up, which is what's happening now. Honestly, it looks really fun. But my mind instantly flashes back to my younger self, listening to K-pop songs and learning the dances at home by myself in secret. And I think about how much has changed in the last 10, 15 years. To the point where now, K-pop fans have an entire weekend-long convention where they can share their love of Korean music and culture with thousands of other people. From Elias Studios, this is K-Pop Dreaming. I'm Vivian Yu, and in this episode, my friends and I go to the 10th anniversary of KCON. The first KCON started over a decade ago, and the story behind it starts in Koreatown. So in the 90s, Koreatown was recovering from the aftermath of the LA uprising because over 2,000 businesses had been burned down or destroyed during that time. And in the aftermath, the neighborhood applied for this special redevelopment status from the city, called CRA, to try and get new investment into the area. A few years later, in 1997, the Asian financial crisis happens, which opens up opportunities for South Korean companies to invest in Koreatown. So in the 2000s, all these new commercial buildings and high-rise condos go up in K-Town, and South Korean companies start thinking about how to build their presence in Los Angeles. Which brings us to this one company called CJ Group, a giant South Korean conglomerate that produces all kinds of things like food, health and beauty, biotech, pharmaceuticals, and more. So for years, CJ America had its headquarters in New York. But in 2003, they decided to relocate their head office to Los Angeles. I think we were looking at a lot of things, and we were trying to understand our audience. This is Angela Killoran, CEO of CJ ENM America. So Angela comes up with this idea for a multi-day K-pop fan convention that would bring all these different aspects of Korean music and culture to fans in America. We kind of developed this idea of really how do we super serve the K-pop fan? What, what it is it that they would love? Of course, the concert. But, you know, different groups had been having concerts for a number of years. And the convention part of it was if you're a K-pop fan and your dream would be to go to Korea, why don't we bring Korea here? So that's why we have, you know, food, we have beauty, we have dance sessions, we have, you know, we have panels and workshops. The event is called KCON. And when she first proposes the idea, she's met with some resistance. Like, are you sure you want to take this huge risk to create this event? Because K-pop used to be big, but now it's on the downward path. I mean, Super Junior Girls' Generation were the biggest artists in Asia. And they had gotten, you know, maybe started to get a little bit older. And so... I think there was a concern that there was no new groups coming out. And so, oh my gosh, maybe this is the end. So this was in the beginning of 2012, months before Psy would come out with Gangnam Style. And at the time, K-pop was at the tail end of the second generation in this weird transition period where people didn't really know what was next for the genre. So the idea of a K-pop convention in America at this time was considered a big risk. But eventually, the team got the go-ahead from the higher-ups. KCON was going to happen. And they'd choose a location in Irvine, California. There was an outside sort of uh, grassy courtyard, a big area. And then there was an outdoor concert venue. 
This is Sang Cho, another executive at CJ America at the time who was helping put KCON together. We had, I think, four to five rookie boy groups and then um, had four minute uh, sort of be the headliner for the event. Like during the day, we had food trucks and uh, activity booths where we had fan engagement. And then we had, you know, panels and workshops and things like that, just like any other, you know, pop culture conventions, right? We worked day and night to get this thing ready. None of us knew what we're doing. Sang remembers staying up all night before the premiere of KCON, prepping for the event. And he was nervous. There wasn't a, enough of a lead time to promote. We didn't have the budget to, again, promote and things like that. So it was all just kind of social media, just on the strengths of some tweet. Finally, the day arrives. And on the morning of Saturday, October 13th, 2012. We all go to the venue like six in the morning and the venue security runs out to us. Um, you know, there's been people here in this parking lot since 3 a.m. And the show wasn't technically opening until I think 1 p.m. or 12 noon. And then it just got crazier from there um, to the point where the fire marshal uh, came and forced us to open doors a couple of hours earlier. So obviously we weren't ready again. So it was a, a I'm sure you bleeped this out, but it was a complete shit show, um, but in a good way. Like, you know, fans were having a great time and they kind of helped the staff members organize and crowd controls. We were really, really, really not sure. Um, I mean, we knew that people had said on Facebook, I'm going to be there. This is Angela again, CEO of CJENM America. We had nearly 10,000 people show up for that first concert event. We really had no idea. KCON was a surprising success, and the team decided to build on it. So the following year, they decided to move the convention to L.A. And every year, KCON kept growing in size and scope, adding more events, panels, workshops. And they even expanded the concerts to take place over two days instead of one. The concerts, by the way, are a huge part of KCON. And K-pop idols make appearances throughout the entire weekend, too, as part of special events and meet and greets. After the break, my friends and I head to one of these meet and greets to see a K-pop idol group up close. We'll be right back. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. We are always growing and learning, and that's why getting to know yourself can be a lifelong process, and it can be really rewarding. I personally have definitely benefited from therapy. I'm already a pretty self-reflective person, but speaking with a therapist gave me the tools and language to take that self-reflection to the next level. And it helped me become a less anxious, more relaxed version of myself, which I love. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online and it's designed to fit your schedule, no matter how busy it is. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash dreaming today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash dreaming. Support comes from Cal Poly Pomona. Launch your career in Masters of Digital Supply Chain Management, one of the fastest growing fields globally. Learn the latest technologies and best practices for optimizing supply chain operations in a digital world. With strong industry relevance, their program provides you with the skills you need to lead digital transformations and drive operational efficiencies in your supply chains. Join them today and take the next step in your career. Learn more at cpp.edu slash cba. Right now, I'm standing at the edge of this huge crowd that has gathered around this platform on the convention floor. There are a bunch of stages like this one scattered around the expo. And all these people are waiting for a fourth generation idol boy band called N Hyphen. N Hyphen! N Hyphen, I got Everyone is screaming, holding up their phones, trying to record whatever is happening on stage. I get on my tiptoes and try to look over people's heads and at their phone screens, but I can't really see what's going on, so I ask someone what's happening. They're getting the crowd to scream, like, N, hype in, so it's really exciting. Oh, I'm so excited, like, 
they're just like I'm a little older so they all feel like my sons so I'm really excited to see them succeed and like be here and see all the people who are really big fans of them and it, oh my gosh oh my god it's absolute pandemonium this is what Sarah Randy and I came to KCON to experience for years, we've been confused about the rise of K-pop and wondered how it got to be so popular. And KCON is like the pinnacle of this phenomenon. Eventually, Sarah, Randy, and I need a break from the noise. So we head to a quieter section of the expo. Can we maybe take a break while we just get a bunch oh, of free stuff? <laughs> do you do skincare? Well, you're gonna start. At least some sunblock. So, KCON is centered around K pop, but the convention covers a bunch of other Korean things too, like food and health and beauty. Because technically, KCON isn't just about K pop, but all things Hallyu. So, Hallyu means Korean wave, and it refers to the rise of Korean entertainment and culture abroad which includes all kinds of cultural exports from South Korea, like music, dramas, movies, food, clothing, skincare, etc. And the term Hallyu was actually coined back in the late 90s, during the heyday of K-pop's first idol group, H.O.T. Now, people are talking about the explosion of Hallyu in recent years as Korean TV and film dominate pop culture discussions. Squid Games, Parasite, it's all part of the buildup of Hallyu, the Korean wave. Fun fact, the person who gave KCON the green light at CJ was Mickey Lee, the same person who produced Parasite. Anyway, the interest in K-pop and K-culture has gotten so big in the U.S. that the most recent KCON, the one we are at right now, has 90,000 attendees, which is nine times the size of the first one in 2012. And as I look around the event, I'm realizing most of the attendees aren't Korean like this grandmother I met on the convention floor. Hi. Hello, can uh, we get your name, please? My name is Nettie Washington. Awesome. Uh, is this your first KCON? Yes, this is my first one. Nettie was actually an elected official of a city in the San Joaquin Valley. But today, she's just a grandmother experiencing her very first KCON with her granddaughter. Yeah. My granddaughter invited me to come to her because Five years ago, I introduced her to K-pop. I have to hear that story. <laughs> well, I used to watch K-dramas. My whole family ragged on me about watching K-dramas. So when you're watching K-dramas, you hear the music. And I'm a music person, so all of a sudden I said, okay, who are these people singing? So I started trying to find out, you know, who they were. That's how I found K-pop. This is something I've heard from a lot of fans, by the way that they got into K-pop through K-drama OSTs. But Nettie went down the rabbit hole of Korean music and ended up introducing the genre to her granddaughter. I said, do you know about this thing called K-pop? And so she said, no, Grants, what is it? So I told her and then she went to school and one of her friends said, your grandma watches K-pop? <laughs> and so she says, my grandma watches K-dramas all the time and listens to K-pop music. As we're chatting, a tall girl with her hair up in cute buns comes up to us. Hi, Hi. I think this is your granddaughter it behind you. Granddaughter. Hi! Hello! This is Nettie's granddaughter, Karina Terichi, and her eyes are twinkling with excitement. Because as it turns out, Karina is one of the luckiest people at the convention today. She just got an up-close Polaroid picture of the boy band from earlier and Hypen. And... I just won um, the event to go take a picture with Kepler. And I was so excited because she won a t-shirt yesterday and I, I got like a little photo card and I was like, I'm just going to try it again today. And I got it. I have never won anything in my life. Definitely not a chance to get a photo with my favorite musical artists. So this moment feels really exciting. And as I walk and talk with Corinna, I ask how she wound up at KCON with her grandma. When I went to register for KCON, the first thing I thought about was my grandma. I was like, she would love this because she, she's into the whole thing. She's into the skincare, she's into the music, she's into the dramas. She, it's not, she's just not a K-pop fan, she's like a Korean fan. She loves it all. Corinna says she used to see her grandma pretty often, but that changed after COVID. 
since the pandemic, it's been a lot harder to see my grandparents. So like this little time I have with my grandma right now has like been very fun and I'm very thankful for it. So it's like our special bond. Finally, it's time for Corinna to get her photo with girl group Kepler. Sarah and Randy join me as I follow Corinna into a VIP area. Technically, we aren't supposed to be there, but I hold up my badge and act confident like I'm supposed to be there. All right, we're getting past the metal railings to follow Corinna for her photo opportunity. Oh, wow. Okay, awesome. We're gonna... Wow. It's a very bright room. Okay. I still can't believe this happened. We enter the booth that's been reserved for the event. It actually belongs to Kepler and another group from their same label. The whole space is themed like a candy shop, with purple shelves full of giant candy jars and photos of Kepler on the walls. And this is the first time I realize Kepler has nine members. Sarah and Randy find a corner and try to look inconspicuous. And I stay next to Corinna, who stands against the back wall in front of these giant plastic candy displays. (laughs) Can you describe what is happening right now? Uh, Yes, so I'm here with a bunch of other people and we all are the ticket winners. Uh, We're waiting for the girls. Uh, I think we're all very nervous, (laughs) right? Yeah, I, uh, I think some of us are cosplaying, right? You guys are from the Up video. Yeah, very cute. Um, I think there's a bunch of people also waiting to see Kepler. So I feel very lucky to actually get to be here. How do you feel? Super nervous. Super, super nervous. Do you have a favorite member of Kepler? Yes. I like Bahi. What do you love about her? It's her presence. Like, she's the member that stands out to me. And she's a very sweet, like, she came on the stage earlier. She has a very sweet personality. She's also very tall. <laughs> I think I'm biased towards tall people. <laughs> um, yeah, she's, she's like, um, I think she also speaks a lot of English. But yeah, she's very um, talented. She's a good dancer, and she has a really lovely voice. Really lovely voice. Yeah. We hear cheering, and I look straight ahead to see Kepler entering the booth. Nine girls looking exactly like what you would think K-pop idols look like. Perfect skin, hair, makeup. Each one is wearing some kind of plaid in different colors, like skirts, dresses, tops. We're going to have one of the members come out at a time to take a group photo. So we're going to do a Polaroid and a phone specifically on their own. So, I'm going to call them out in order. Oh my gosh. Yes. Are you nervous? I'm so nervous. Hope? Oh, they're going to call us out. Hope? Okay. One by one, each of the winners gets called to the front to take a picture with the group. I'm And I haven't even gone. Finally, the moment comes. Oh my gosh, that's Corinna T, that's you. Before Corinna leaves... She holds up her hand in half a heart to Huning Baye, her favorite member. And Baye opens up her own hand, completing the heart. And that's it. <gasps> she got to match hearts. You got to match hearts. I got a heart from my bias. I saw you got yeah. to match hearts. Thank you. How do you feel? Wow, flustered. I think, like, I'm like, thinking, like, what if my pose was bad? <laughs> Oh, you took a video? Oh, well, I took a, yeah, she took a short video here. We leave the roped-off area and wind up getting a great spot to see Kepler exit. Kepler is walking through now, and Corinna is going to get one last goodbye. I'm so lucky! (laughs) I just, oh my gosh, I'm so glad that, like, this is starting to be happening and that happened, but like I've been wanting to like tell um, Bahi like like you're doing such a good job, like keep going, like I just wanna like support her so much. I think um there's been it's been like a little bit harder for her because she's um half American, so it might be harder for her to blend in with the group. So I'm like really happy that she's happy. <laughs> The way Corinna talks about Kepler and her favorite member, Huning Paye, it's so personal, like she really knows these idols. And this is something I've heard from a lot of K-pop fans, how they feel like they have a genuine personal connection with the artists. 
and a lot of fans feel like their favorite idols really do care about them. I feel like this is relatively new for K-pop in the U.S., like my friends and I did not experience this kind of connection growing up. But now, there is so much effort taken by the artists to make their fans feel seen and heard and loved. A lot of people I talk to say this is part of the reason why the third-generation groups took off in the 2010s. The rise of social media allowed for K-pop artists to develop deeper connections with their international fans and engage with them a lot more than they were able to before. It all led to the explosion of K-pop. And I have to say, being here at KCON, I totally get it. I can see how one look or wave or word of thanks can make you feel so special and seen. And it makes me think about the vision for KCON. Connecting K-pop fans with artists. Contributing to that feeling of personal investment and connection. And it's turning me into a fan. Not just of these groups, but of KCON itself. After the break, I talk to a vendor from South Korea to see how he feels about the current explosion of K-pop. We'll be right back. So I've been in the market for a new car. I drive between the Bay Area and Los Angeles pretty often, and I really want to get a new hybrid, something that doesn't just offer mileage, but comfort and luxury too, because those drives are long, which is why I was so excited when I found out about the Kia Niro. It has three electrified powertrains to choose from, hybrid, plug-in hybrid, and all electric. And the 2023 Nero Hybrid offers an EPA-estimated 53 mpg combined rating. Plus, it has a high-tech interior designed to keep you connected to your life, the road, and all the adventures ahead. The 2023 Nero from Kia. Learn more at kia.com. Based on EPA estimates, actual mileage will vary with options, driving conditions, driving habits, and your vehicle's condition. For more information, please see www.fueleconomy.gov. Have you heard about the Melrose Trading Post in Los Angeles? It's a weekly outdoor community market with live music that supports innovative art education programs for LAUSD students. Shop for handmade or vintage goods and enjoy delicious food. Melrose Trading Post is open every Sunday from 9 to 5 at Fairfax High School on Melrose and Fairfax. For a $3 discount when you buy tickets, go to melrosetradingpost.org and enter the code LAIST. Back on the convention floor, I look for Randy and Sarah, who have somehow disappeared. Eventually, I spot them in the K-beauty area, where there are all these mini booths for Korean beauty brands to show off and sell their products. Everything from collagen sticks to face masks, skincare sets, even special shower heads that adjust the pH level of your water. Let's get some free stuff. Yeah, I want free stuff. Free shit! Free, free, free. What else is free? While Sarah and Randy wander off for freebies, I stop at a booth for a South Korean skincare brand called Troy Arike from Syslab. The CEO of the company is actually at the booth. His name is Andy Kim, and he flew into L.A. from Seoul. And aside from my friends, Andy is the first Korean person I've spoken with all day. We believe that uh, skin is the best dress that we can wear. Would you agree? Because we are born with one skin and then we have to take care of it until as we get old and smelly, obviously. Andy says he isn't too familiar with the current generation of K-pop. He was more into the first generation groups like H.O.T. So I ask him what he thinks about K-Con. I feel really overwhelmed by the emotion because it is really grateful to see that uh, foreign people, Western people, American people, different backgrounds loving our culture, and I really feel great about it, and I feel very appreciated. Do you feel proud to be Korean? Yes, and I also feel very responsible for that. What Uh, do you mean? um, We should not feel that uh, it, it is a privilege to be a Korean, and also I think to have this experience of seeing other people, but I hope that we don't take it as a Granted. Did you always feel proud to be Korean? When I was studying in uh, in the UK, I was only Asian boy. I studied in Scotland, and, um, and there were many people, but only I was Asian. So they asked me, "Where are you from?" And I said, 
I'm from Korea. And she's like, where is Korea? And at that time, Korea never existed within their knowledge. So being at KCON, seeing all these people embracing Korean music and culture. I'm very glad, and I hope that this good vibe and good emotion and good culture continues. I really, really hope that. I thank Andy for his time and start to walk away. When I see Sarah and Randy in the distance, holding a bunch of free stuff. Oh my god, you guys got so much more stuff! Where did you go? um, We hit up a few booths in this corner that we've just been kind of lingering around. We got free pimple sticker. We got, I got mermaid scale um, vitamin E face mask. I got a rabbit. (laughs) (laughs) We love free shit. I mean, free stuff. (laughs) Okay, great. We decide to keep walking, explore the rest of the expo. We roll big fuzzy dice for free lip tint from Olive Young, a giant South Korean beauty retailer. We stop by CJ Entertainment's booth where they're advertising some of their upcoming movies and TV shows. We think about getting in line for free fries at the McDonald's truck, then decide against it. And then we just keep walking around, talking to fans. My favorite 80 song, uh, maybe Deja Vu. I'm really bad at singing, so I'm sorry. Uh... I know you get deja vu. We saw that. I've liked them since um, debut. They were really good. I love their debut song. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I'm a surfer. <laughs> like, I want to scream. By now, it's evening. My friends and I are exhausted, and we're ready to go home. We head towards the exit, crossing the floor one last time. And as I pass by the different booths, all I see is evidence of Hallyu everywhere. In the fans, the products, the merch. And I think back to what Andy, the skincare CEO, said earlier. About how he feels responsible for representing Korean culture and people. And how he hopes Koreans don't take this moment for granted. It's almost like his experience of the way things were before when people had no idea where Korea even was, makes him feel like that could happen again. When the zeitgeist moves on and Korea isn't in the spotlight anymore. And it makes me feel lucky to be experiencing this moment now at KCON. When Sarah, Randy, and I get back to the car, I'm curious to know what their experience was. So we're leaving KCON. What did you guys think? It was really interesting. It was really fun to see everyone's like super like high energy and passion for K-pop. What changed my perspective was that before I was very much like, oh, like why are people so into K-pop now? When like before, it used to be something that that when we liked it, people were kind of like, oh, like what's that kind of like look down on it? My favorite part of today was all the free stuff that we got. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> uh, I think also just a huge community coming together is kind of uplifting, like people knowing all the dances and dancing together every time a song they knew came out. And it was just, um, just a sense of community was very quite wholesome. This is what stuck out to me, too, the sense of community. Everybody over and over again that I talked to was saying how K-pop fans are the best and how it's so easy to just make new friends Mm. because of K-pop. And that's sort of what I really saw at the convention. Like, you're waiting in line, and it's so easy to just strike up a conversation, which I guess is what conventions are for, right? It's for people who love the same thing to come together um, and and get, get a chance to... When I was a fan of K-pop growing up, it was just about the music and the groups for me. Like, it really was a private experience. And it makes me happy to see how far things have come since then, where now there are all these opportunities for fans to be part of a larger community and connect with other people through their shared love of K-pop. It's like the music forms all these invisible bridges between strangers and friends and family members giving all kinds of people everywhere a way to come together. Next time on K-Pop Dreaming, 
For our last episode, my friends and I go back to the neighborhood we grew up in, Koreatown, to see how it reflects some of the history we've talked about and how the neighborhood still continues to be shaped by K-pop today. That's next time on K-pop Dreaming. K-Pop Dreaming is written and hosted by me, Vivian Yoon. The show is a production of Elliest Studios. Fiona Ng is the senior producer and show creator. Our producers are James Chow, Minju Park, and me, Vivian Yoon. Sophia Paliza Carr is our editor. This episode is sound designed by James Chow. Gloria O oh is our Korean researcher and translator. Fact checking by Minju Park. Parker McDaniels is our mix engineer. Our director is Taylor Kaufman. Original music by Stephen Tran. Our interns are Jens Campbell and Sarah Burnett. Special thanks to Jacqueline Kim, Quincy Surismith, Shelley Sangi Lee, Sarah Wan, Randy Lee, Topher Ruth, and the Berkeley Advanced Media Studios. Support for this podcast is made possible by Gordon and Donna Crawford, who believe that quality journalism makes Los Angeles a better place to live. This program is made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Hi, I'm Faith Pinu, the host of Foretold, a new podcast from the LA Times. On Foretold, we'll introduce you to Paulina Stevens, a Romani-American fortune teller who approached us with an incredible story. From preparing for marriage at age 12 to her controversial decision to leave the community, Paulina's story provides a unique glimpse into a culture that outsiders rarely get to see. Listen and follow Foretold at latimes.com slash foretold or wherever you get your podcasts. That's latimes.com slash foretold.